This podcast will help you get ready for the Chapter 8 quiz coming up this week. Just the first thing to start out with is the vocab words. Uh, it's important to go over these with a friend or a family member. It's always good to study with someone else. That way they can ask you questions and also help, make, help you uh, say them out loud. Saying things out loud will help you out quite a bit with remembering them. So go over your vocab with a friend or a family member. Have them either ask you the word and you tell them the definition, or flip it and have them tell you the definition and you tell them the word. If you're studying with somebody with another 8th grader, you can actually go back and forth on them, uh, and that way you guys can both get uh, some study time together. It works out very well. The concepts, these are here to help guide you to get ready for the quiz. Remember, the test is more than just stating the concepts back to me. You actually have to use the concepts. Uh, there's going to be some several application questions on there, and it's always important to make sure you use those when you can. The first of the concepts is looking at the types of pollution. You can see on this picture here, I have uh, point source and non-point source, and that's a very big difference there. You can see down in the lower left corner, we have point sources, and you can see it as being like a factory or something like that that dumps directly into an area. Non-point sources would be like the agricultural uh, sources, so like looking at fertilization of the farm fields or runoff from farm fields, those uh, are considered non-point sources, as well as uh, actually pollution coming from forests. We usually don't think of it that way, but uh, technically a forest is polluting another environment. And then we also have the urban non-point sources, and that'd be like runoff from the roads, septic systems, uh, just general runoff from any uh, any area. Now, the big thing to remember for trying to tell us between a point source and a non-point source is, can you point to it? If you can point at it, then it's a point source. If you know that it's coming from this one spot, you can say it's a point source uh, sort of pollution. Whereas if you're not for sure where it's coming from, in that case, it's a non-point source. The next one is what makes a resource renewable or non-renewable. And it all has to do with how long it takes to regenerate or regrow the resource. You can see down here on the picture, for the left side, it talks about renewable energy, and it shows them all being uh, things that ha uh, happen naturally. So we have like sunlight, uh, bioenergy, actually, wind energy, geothermal, and hydropower energy. Those are all considered renewable fuels. Um, those are actually where um, all the fuels actually originally started from, in fact. Um, but if we look at like biofuel, um, they're thinking of things, or we're thinking in that case of things like ethanol which is taken from corn or switchgrass like we looked at in class, or you can look at burning wood, things like that. Those are all actually considered renewable resources. The non-renewable is looking at like the fuel oils, coal, natural gas, and actually nuclear falls in that category as well. Um, and the reason why those are considered non-renewable is in order to get those back again, it just takes too long. Uh, in order to get back to having coal, you know, you have to have lots and lots of, uh, of dead material, uh, which would be a lot of the bio, uh, the biomass energy that it talks about on the left side, a lot of that has to fall down, be compressed over you know, thousands to millions of years, and that finally gets us to, have, to the point of having coal again, and so that time comes into play. Um, whereas when we're looking at renewable, it's more, if you can also compare it, does, can it occur basically in someone's lifetime, or in a fraction of a lifetime? If it takes more than one lifetime, it's generally going to be a non-renewable source. The next thing you have to do is what's called a cost-benefit analysis. We did several of these in class. We did one uh, as we were reading about the uh, idea of offshore drilling. We also looked at the Keystone Pipeline and did a cost-benefit analysis there, as well as looking at the child uh, or the one-child laws in China. Um, and so those cost-benefit analysis will come very much in handy, and I can guarantee you one will show up on the test or on the I'm sorry the quiz that's coming up. Uh, the cost-benefit analysis, on the left side, you write down all the costs or the bad sides to it. And on the uh, right side, you write down all the benefits or all the good things. And uh, what you do is you list them all down and you try to decide, okay, which side should I go towards? Is it better or is it more worse for us? Now, if you figure that out, it makes it a little bit easier. This is just a good way to organize. And as we saw like in the, uh, the uh, one child law in China, the cost side actually had less things on it, less actual things listed, but they were much better bigger concerns that we had on the benefit side. So it's not necessarily you know, looking at counting up how many you have, it's also looking at what's the importance we place on both of them as well. But it helps you to organize your thoughts to be ready to make a good decision about what's going on. The next thing we looked at was the population growth and what it affects. 
and also how do we control it. Um, for looking at the population growth, you can see on this picture here on the left, um, there's actually um, shows from 2050 BC all the way up till 2050 AD, and of course that's estimate of 2050 AD, the population of Earth um, throughout history. And we can see it stayed very constant up until around you know, the 1700s or so, and we started to see it go up. Uh, of course, we know um, that starting then we started to have advances in technology, um, so people were able to start living longer, and that helped in order to cause us to have, be able to have more people uh, live to a much longer or a much older age, and that started to cause the population to grow very quickly, uh, which makes sense if you can live past 20 years of age, then odds are that the population is going to get larger. You can see on the right here the things that impacted. And you can see that healthcare technology always drives uh, populations up. Because as we improve healthcare, we are better at fighting diseases, which means that more people will live longer. The death rate goes up, population goes down, which makes sense. When more people are uh, when people are dying, then we actually have less population. Food production goes up, and we're able to distribute it better. We actually have an increase in population, and we can see that looking at the United States. And then if you think back in history, like the potato famine and things like that. We can see that the population went down when we had less food around. And then also, uh, the important thing to remember though is when the population goes up, something always has to go down. It has to keep the universe in balance. And so in order to keep, the, uh, keep everything in balance, of course, the natural resources have to go down because we're using those up for the food production and building houses and, keep, uh, and all the other side effects of human population. Uh, and then, of course, Obviously, if more people are being born with the birth rate increasing, the population has to go up. That just makes sense. Now, of course, some of the ways that that's controlled we talked about with uh, the Chinese rules. Um, and then also we can look at uh, other different social concerns. Uh, and you can actually even go back to thinking about, you know, we do a similar thing with trying to keep the animal population under control. I'm thinking about how we control that and keep it in check. Now, of course, we don't do quite the exact same extremes uh, for the two uh, because it's a different population, but there are some similarities there for as far as the population growth. And we see that, again, as we have improvements in health care, better food, we, usually, we also have an increase in the number of animals, too. The next part was looking at the different types of forestry practices. We just looked at that today, um, and that was talking about selective cutting and clear cutting. Selective cutting is just when you cut down just a few trees, whereas clear cutting is cutting down all the trees. Talked about going to the Christmas tree farm, and if you go there, that sometimes they've actually clear cut a field um, because the field has been used up, and so they're actually getting ready to replant it into uh, having all new trees, whereas then in other sections you'll see they'll have done selective cutting. They'll cut out you know, maybe the six-foot trees this year, but they will leave some of the five-foot trees for next year so they have some more six-foot trees. And that's an important thing to remember uh, that they do in order to try to keep the population um, to be diverse enough, but also to protect the animals that are living there. Um, there's some other concerns that come along with that too, and we can look at this picture here on the left. You can see this is an area that has been clear cut. And you can see that the water runoff becomes quite an issue there. Uh, you can see it started to flood quite a bit. And that is a major concern because there's not all the tree roots there to help absorb the water and then also to keep the uh, ground from being eroded away. On the right-hand side, you can see it has had some stuff removed. Um, but down, the, um, down in the area where my mouse is highlighting right now, you can see that that's actually where it has been selectively cut. They trimmed out some of the trees there. And it does make sense to trim some of the trees out. For example, uh, as we saw in the video, if they have dead trees, they want to get those out of there. But also looking at removing uh, certain trees to use them for timber. So we can actually get trees out of there while still continuing to have the population grow. Uh, I'm not for sure on this picture, but I'm guessing the part up here, this, has probably not been, this was probably clear cut, but it's probably been clear cut for some other purpose like housing or uh, recreation up there. The last thing we talked about were the types of fishery and how we actually keep track of fishing. Fishery, remember, is talking about areas that have a large population of fish. And there's uh, several ways to keep control of how many, or how many fish are in the ocean. Um, the first thing is the fishing limits. Basically, it reduces the number of fish that are caught and it makes sure that fish live long enough to reproduce. That's why they have fishing seasons and you have to get a fishing license and you can't get fish outside of a certain size range things like that. It helps to make sure that we actually are able to have fish, one, for when you go out for sport fishing, but two, for if you're in, uh, in the 
uh, practice of actually uh, harvesting fish for sale, you want to make sure you protect your area that you're getting your fish from so that you have plenty to come back to later. The next thing is looking at different fishing methods. They can't use destructive methods anymore. Uh, destructive methods, what that's referring to is throwing dynamite in the water and watching all the fish come up. It's not a very good way of catching fish because you're going to get a lot of bycatch is what it's called. It's actually additional fish that are found inside there. And if you have other fish in there that you were not trying to catch, you actually can get a fine for it. And it's not a good situation. Not to mention, it's not a fish that you can actually sell, so you don't want to collect those at that time. You want to come back and collect those when you can actually sell them. So there's a lot of benefits to trying to make sure you use a non-destructive method. Not to mention, it's quite a bit safer than trying to throw dynamite in the water. There's also aquaculture, um, which is much um, like farming. Basically, you grow your own fish. Um, it's actually becoming a much more popular thing. We have like tilapia that is actually being farm-raised, as well as a farm-raised catfish and several other types of fish to try to uh, offset some of the natural habitats so we aren't having to go in and get quite as much out of the ocean if we can get another source to get them from. And the last thing is actually trying to expand our palates to find some new fish. Um, find something else that we can actually eat and they're actually trying to find more of the deep water fish because we have not harvested from them as much. Uh, we're getting better at actually having the technology to get those fish and uh, we could possibly even use them as an additional food source, which would be definitely a beneficial thing. But of course, that then comes into play how does it affect populations of fish and of humans and uh, so forth. So it definitely requires maybe a cost benefit analysis or something like that. Now, one other thing I want to remind you of is, as I've said down at the bottom, the claims and evidence. Remember to go through those. There are several questions that relate directly to those investigations. Uh, so it's always a good idea to look through at those, what you had to write your claims on, what your evidence was, flip through those investigations, but the claims and evidence are always an important part of any quiz or test. Remember, if you have any questions, you can ask them here on my big campus, or you can ask them in class uh, either today or right before the test. Good luck.